Hello, everyone. Today we have Dr. Juan Carlos Neto, and he uh, is a good friend for a long time and um, excited to get his insights on, on some geeky areas here on pig production and um, genomics, ecology, and other topics. Welcome to the show, Dr. Neto. Thank you, Marcel. It's nice to be here and uh, return to talk to you about uh, you know, uh, microbiology and how that intersects with the, with the swine industry. Super cool. So, uh, João, how did you get involved in pig production? And if you can also share your journey so far for folks that are not familiar with uh, your career. So I am uh, originally from Brazil and I got a DVM. Uh, from the Federal University of Lavras. Basically throughout my veterinary training, I was involved in one way or another with research and extension in swine, uh, swine production. So all my training throughout uh, the veterinary training was related to going to swine farms and learning about production, nutrition, reproduction, and so forth. After I graduated, I had the opportunity to do a traineeship in Netherlands. Uh, with topics. Uh, so uh, there I learned some about uh, the intersection between reproduction and pig genetics. And after returning to Brazil, I went straight to the swine industry. I worked for two years as a swine veterinarian and uh, advising consulting farms, especially doing some work in swine health and production. And, but, I, but I always had this passion for, for, for research. Uh, and that's what drove me to return to science and then engage into doing a master's degree. So I came to United States in 2010. Uh, I came to Iowa State University where I did a master's in uh, veterinary microbiology. My work there was related to swine mycoplasmas. And, uh, and then from there, I kind of... Uh, went on a tangent to do something different. I, I was passionate about immunology and I want to learn more about uh, basic immunology. And due to fund limitations and those things, I ended up doing a PhD in food science at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. But my work was mostly related to models of intestinal inflammation and rodents, especially mouse models. That's how I got into doing gut microbiology and immunology. Uh, and, and then after that, I had a, a short postdoc at the University of Utah Medical Center, where I continued doing some intestinal inflammation, GI models of disease. So, but my, my mindset was already shifted towards doing ecology and uh, population microbiology, if you will. Uh, so, so then that postdoc was, while, was, while that postdoc was nice, I returned to, U, uh, to UNL uh, to do a postdoc in bacterial genomics. And because I had developed that passion during my PhD. And I wanted a way to go back to the livestock industry, to agriculture research, uh, where, when, in, a, in a way that I could combine all my training immunology, microbiology, and now some computational biology. And the way for me was doing uh, bacterial genomics with relationships to food safety, with applications to food safety. So my research right now is uh, focused on salmonella. Uh, we do salmonella genomics at scale to learn patterns, things that we can learn about the population that relates to the ecology of the organism in farms. But I'm not restricted only to swine. We look globally. We look uh, not only not only we're not restricted geographically, but we are also looking at what's going on in poultry poultry production systems, uh, bovine production systems, swine, and humans as well, because that's a zoonotic pathogen. Very good. Well, certainly a topic that is. Um... You know, it's a polemic topic, and and you hear different versions of the, of the story when it comes to antimicrobial resistance, and also how how much is that linked uh, to livestock? So, what what's your insight there? Yeah, so that's a it's a, it is a very complex topic because the the issue is an ecological issue. It's not an issue of uh, whether 
using less or more or not using at all is going to influence this because uh, uh, antibiotic resistant genes uh, are widespread, right? Uh, the way we see this is, is slightly different. We look at antimicrobial resistance and the A for AMR stands for antimicrobial. And it's very important that we look at that way because resistance to uh, antimicrobials is not only resistance to antibiotics. Uh, heavy metals are antimicrobials. Zinc, those, copper. Yeah, zinc, copper, yep. So those can now influence resistance, right? And the emergence of resistance strains of any given species. The way we look at it is that antimicrobial resistance is like the eukaryotic guys, the swine geneticists would think. It's just one trait. It's just one phenotype. Whether that phenotype, that trait, resistance, is what is driving the emergence of a, a pathogenic uh, population of salmonella, it's a, not a very easy question to answer. Because sometimes you look at that population and all the genes that come from resistance are already there. And if they are already there in every single isolate you look at, is it really the, you know, the trait that is driving the emergence or maybe something else? So antimicrobial resistance is obviously uh, complex. Clearly, there is a role for our influence in the system. The utilization of antimicrobials uh, expectedly would drive some selection that would influence the emergence of more resistant things or more resistant isolates. But linking the utilization or not to a specific emergence of disease in, in the human population, which is the, you know, the, the ultimate outcome that people are looking at, it's not very easy. That makes sense. And I remember several years ago watching a presentation on the topic, and and I don't know if I'm getting this right, you correct me, but like I think the correlation or, or the the livestock production was maybe 10% of the overall problem. Uh, the biggest problem was the you know just the human side of things and um antimicrobial over prescription and, and not following the what the doctor prescribed and, and halfway stop the treatment. Is that a fair statement or what's your take there? Yeah, that's a fair statement because you know we go to a doctor and you have some, you know, I'm not gonna say that it happens all the time, but you go to the doctor, you have respiratory symptoms, and then before you notice you're taking amoxicillin. But, but there's no diagnosis, right? There's no, there's a, like, you're not, you don't take a swab, send to, the, send to the lab and find out if you have flu or something else. And, and then you're taking a course of amoxicillin, which clearly will impact the microbiota. And, and should you have taken that course, right? But then you can imagine like, oh, if I take only that, perhaps will not impact much of the, what's going on in the environment because, you know, that I am... Uh, I, I don't contribute that much, right? <laughs> right. But it, it's just but like voting, start, right? If I don't vote, it's probably fine. Exactly. Which is, That's which is no, not true. Exactly. So, but then if you start thinking as it scales up, you know, as more and more kids go to a pediatrician and they're taking antibiotics and they're taking antibiotics over the course of, uh, of you know, years, mm -hmm. things can change in the environment. And, 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 and we're now at, uh, at the stage that my view is this. Right now, there's a lot of finger pointing. Oh, uh, the, the human side is, so it's livestock is the problem. The livestock side is kind of unprotected because there's lack of data, which is one issue that we need to talk about. So, okay, how do we really collect data to understand what's going on? There are folks doing that, but how do we do this more globally in a more, in a more cohesive way, right? But the issue is this, no matter what we say, there is a problem because there, so there's more and more emergence of pathogens that are multi-drug resistant. Whether or not it is coming strictly from poultry or from pigs, I don't know if it's a, it's a, if it's a really relevant question. We should be thinking that livestock production and human society is a one ecosystem. And, it's, and, and this buzzword that we have of one health are we really doing One Health right now? Are we really trying to understand One Health right now? Because this is really one single ecosystem. 
super interesting. And, you know, in this topic, I was a, a dumb question here, right? But let's say just to get it very simple, and then we're going to geek out here with our expertise on, on some other areas, but getting very simple here. When you power wash a, a room and you, you clean it up pretty good and you disinfect, I mean, is that also like you're so you're probably selecting a little bit uh you're selecting the survivors of the, that bacteria is that a fair statement so my point is like you said before zinc copper anything really it's just natural selection right yeah it is natural selection i can give you this example that you just gave the use of disinfectants in you know in commercial facilities or hospitals it doesn't really matter right the question is could bacteria be resistant to that oh yes for instance i'll give you one example Quaternary ammonium or quats. Uh, there are specific genes present in the bacterial genome that could come from resistance to that. We are studying a population of Salmonella Newport, for instance, in a, in a manuscript that we're preparing, that we see a sub lineage of Salmonella Newport that is resistant to quats. And then you say, wow, if uh, that population that is resistant, could the use of quads be link, linked to the emergence of that? But then if you start looking at the that same population that has resistance to quads, you start finding resistance to other antimicrobials as well. Mm -hmm. And then the it, question is, which one is driving it? Which one? And, and let's just talk about uh, sunlight. Yeah. I mean, sunlight's going to kill, uh, what, 99.9% .9 of, of a given pathogen, maybe. But then... Um, but then is that part of right? So it's super yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's you. It's, it's it's all these factors. You can't all these factors: UV light, uh, pH, uh, heavy metals, uh, disinfectants, uh, the amount of humidity, uh, water because there's water activity, right? The amount of humidity, all of that influence the viability of cells. Bacteria, you know, they are just individual cells that comprise the population. But you know. So that's kind of sometimes we, we lose we lose perspective in saying, well, the things that only drive emergencies uh, drug resistance. Not really. There's a lot of uh, nutrition going on as well. Much like you think of pig nutrition, you got to think of bacterial nutrition as well. <laughs> right, right. Mm, I was going to ask you about the... Um the uh, it goes back to correlation causation right so like all this you don't know exactly what's causing no you don't know which exactly which is the the root of the problem here which one so if i go to a fast sound let's let's give a, a practical example i look at uh, pig production sites right now and i do isolation of salmonella strains and i see the salmonella monophasic which one is one that people are caring about right now salmonella monophasic salmonella enterica is to give you just a quick perspective, Salmonella enterica, subspecies enterica, is comprised of more than 2,000 serovars of Salmonella. That's how we think of Salmonella, right? The one that comes to, that comes to first to mind right now is Salmonella typhimurium. It's the one that we care about because it can cause gastroenteritis in pigs and in humans. Salmonella typhimurium can be subdivided into biphasic and monophasic. And that has to do with the flagellum that, which is one, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protein that allows the bacteria to move around. Monophasic, we have, let's simply say monophasic, we have one, biphasic, we have two. And monophasic is a population that is emerging and causing disease in humans worldwide, multi drug resistance. But if you look at the population monophasic, one thing you're going to find as well is that it's, it has all the genetic elements to be resistant to three heavy metals, silver, arsenic, and copper. Uh, immediately you ask the question, if I see a lot of monophasic surviving in the pig population, how, what is the impact of copper and silver in the diet of the animals for the persistence of monophasic in pigs worldwide? Right. And because, you know, it, it then comes to the question you're asking. Okay, if I see Salmonella monophasic emerging and persisting, contribution of antibiotic resistance when antibiotic is not even being used, depending on the facility, versus the contribution of these other pathways, such as copper resistance, silver resistance, or something else that we're not even looking at. 
right? Your expertise, on, I mean, on the topic of uh, genomics, ecology, data science, really multidisciplinary expertise. Uh, how, how does all of that fit together in, in this conversation? Yeah, so this issue of, uh, let's call AMR bacteria emerging, emerging AMR bacteria, right? Because in the end of the day, we'll care about how can we treat in the hospitals and how can we improve that? How can we treat the animals because of well-being and all those things, right? Uh, well, first of all, there's no way to do AMR research without doing genomics. You have to use genomics to find out two things. Uh, what are the populations? Much like if you did uh, pig genetics, you do, you know, you, you understand what are the, you know, the family structure of the population. You can do the same thing for bacteria. They do also have family structure. Well, that's one thing. The second thing is that once you have identified the lineages that are of importance, what does it have? What are the unique genetic elements that it has? You can use genomics for that. Now, that's not going to answer the question of the phenotype. Much like in pigs, I have the genetics that can grow fast, but you know, I want to see the, the feed conversion and the growth development because that's the true phenotype, right? In bacteria as well, I want to see the resistance in the lab because I want to measure the phenotype. We can predict that using genomics, but we need to test for that in the lab. Now, you can do genomics, but you can't do genomics without an ecological context. If I simply go and get a thousand isolates of salmonella and sequence it, no matter where it comes from, I can learn something. But if I get those thousand isolates from pigs, cattle, poultry, and humans from the same geographical area, now I can learn a lot more because that's part of a potential ecosystem. Mm -hmm. that's, how eco that's how ecology comes about, right? In identifying the signal out of the noise. Because genomics data, whether you're looking at pigs, cattle, or bacteria, there's a lot of noise. Mm -hmm. We want to fish out the signal. To fish out the signal, we need to couple genomics with ecology. Now, how does data science fits into the conversation? Well, you can't really do that without a lot of data. Uh, like the, since it is the statistician mindset, right? We need more. <laughs> and, and, and there's no way we, we really need more. But we, we, we don't need more just in any random way. We need more. We need to scale the analysis, which requires computational power. But we need to scale in a very strategic way. And the strategic way is by consider the, considering that familiar structure that I just said, because random sampling is not going to work, and considering the ecological uh, questions and hypotheses that you have. Now, when you say that, give me a number, right? How many genomes do you need to start learning something? Uh, it's really in the thousands, like in the 5,000s, 10,000s and more. It's when you start learning something because one thing that people forget, and I don't see, we don't see a lot in the studies that are being conducted recently is this. If, I, if you tell me, Carlos, there is a population of Salmonella monophasic that has emerged in the human population. It's causing an outbreak right now. Public health lab in CDC are monitoring, and we have those isolates. What do they have that is different than any other isolate of Salmonella monophasic? What I'm getting at is this. That's when the ecology really matters to fish out the signal because the isolates that cause clinical problems are just a fraction of the population. There is a, an entire fraction, bigger fraction that is environmental. There's Salmonella monophasic that will never make to the humans. But if I only consider in the analysis the ones that cause clinical problem, I don't eliminate the signal, this, the noise, sorry, the noise that's shared with the environmental ones. Give me an example. Let's say we found 100 genes present that are uniquely present in the isolates that cause clinical problems in humans. Is it really unique to that population? We need to use the environmental isolates to fish out the noise. That means go grab isolates from cattle, pigs, poultry, mm -hmm. that have not made to humans yet, and then compare them to eliminate the noise because if there is shared content, 
then you can find out what's truly unique about the ones that cause disease in humans. So it's not simple in the sense that we just look in what's going on in the humans or just what's going on in the pigs. If you're trying to understand what's going on across the food chain, we need to, to, we need to use genomics and environmental samples plus clinical samples. I love it. And on, on, on follow-up question on that, um, Carlos, which is, you know, how should our industry, so what's coming up for our industry and how, how should this conversation go around? What, so one big issue that the industry is facing and will continue to face is, uh, is data privacy. So how do you deal with that, right? Because, you know, the, the investigators, lawyers, they're all trying to, there's, when there's an outbreak, everybody's trying to point a finger to a specific farm. That's the, the idea of uh, trace back epidemiology, right? We want to know where it's coming from and we want to be able to protect the industry, but also there is litigation issues that can emerge from that. So for the industry to move forward with research, there has to be a mechanism to protect the farmers and the, uh, the industry in general to prevent, you know, uh, lawyers and the other side of the equation to come and point fingers to specific, uh, specific, you know, segments of the industry, because that's not our goal. I, as a researcher here, I want to understand how specific lineages make for all the way from, from pigs to humans. But I don't want to, I don't want to point fingers to a farm. That's not my goal. I really want to understand the ecology. So one way of moving forward could be to, for the industry, to have these completely independent centers, data centers that would de-identify the sample. And that's a way to be linking the industry and academia. Because for me, I don't care which farm it comes from. I just care about getting a sample. And you can say farm A, B, C, D, I don't care. I just want to, to know a little bit of a, about the epidemiology so I can do the analysis that we need to do to learn something. So that's one point. The second point is this. We can't just look at AMR as the big problem. We need to look at the evolution and the ecology of these traits. AMR is a problem, but is it the driver of the emergence of pathogenic lineage that can cause disease in humans? or in animals, we don't know. That's why we need to look in an agnostic fashion for traits like the guys, the pig geneticists, the cattle geneticists, you look for the traits and how those traits correlate to the, to the familial structure that we see in the population of bacteria. So that's the second point, right? One is data privacy, the other one is this uh, uh, looking at traits and agnostically, not just focusing on AMR. And the second, the third one, which is big, is what I said. We cannot just use sequence from isolates that are causing clinical issues. That's a fraction of the population. We need to look at environmental isolates as well. And while doing a lot of genomics, we need metadata. Uh, right now, if you go to NCBI or any data deposit, you know, any data storage uh, uh, mechanism, you'll find out that you can find a lot of sequence, but reliable metadata that tells me where it came from, the host, the antibiotic usage in that farm, it's not there. And mostly it's not there because of all these issues of data privacy we're talking about. Very interesting. And as you think about your expertise and what's coming to, to our industry, um, how, sh uh, how should we educate our professionals? And also, what is the role? I know you're expert in R and also Python and, and uh, probably MySQL, uh, SQL and, and those things. Do we need more folks that know how to program, I guess? It's also the second part of this question. Yeah, I, so I am... I came to this with, with the, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give my context to say the way I think, because the way I think about this problem, which is a big problem, is, uh, has evolved over time. So uh, when you go to vet school, uh, back in Brazil, we would not take a lot of calculus, right? And right. everybody says, well, if you're going to learn stats, do we need calculus? Well, if you're doing just experimental statistics, uh, perhaps you can, you can do that without calculus. 
But it's the point is not calculus. The point is how much math are we, how much quantitative skills are we providing to our professionals throughout their education? So it's, I think more right now as quantitative skills. You don't need to be a mathematician or a statistician to learn how to do a little bit of programming, to learn how to think quantitatively of a problem. So the way I trained myself was going on uh, during my grad, graduate training and taking statistical course and taking online training and on, on, on the, one of these MOOCs like Data Camp and all those things, right? And then you, you, know, you self-train yourself. Now I see the problem and then I say, how do we improve education for animal scientists and, and veterinary, veterinary professionals? We need more quantitative training. And the way to do more quantitative training is with classes, you know, integrating coding into epidemiology classes or uh, quantitative microbiology classes. We need that. Uh, you don't need to be a bioinformatician uh, when you get out of uh, vet school. But you need to be able to look at a phylogenetic tree and say, oh, wow, there is a pattern here. You don't need to understand the math behind the phylogeny. But if you understand that there is a pattern and there is something going on, that would help you to understand more of the context, right, of what could be and not uh, influencing what you're seeing in the farm. I love so it. So that's, me... kind of, that's the way I think right now. It's more quantitative training. Right. Imagine... 20 years ago or something when Excel came around or whatever, you know, today everyone knows Excel. Some people know more, some people know less, but it's something that you need to know if you want to be alive in the world today, almost, you know, and uh, it's almost coming to the point that you younger generations are probably going to be pretty, pretty good at uh, programming and those things. Yeah, you know, and, and even for, you know, that would, that would be applicable to analyzing production data as well. You know, there are all these softwares to analyze production data, right? And they're very useful, very nice. But perhaps you can download all this, the, you know, the, the Excel files, the CSV files and start playing with the data in R. Mm -hmm. And perhaps by not being, you know, uh, restricted to the options the program gives you, a PigChimp or, or, or others that are out there, which are all really nice. I'm not saying that they're not. But it would open your mindset to analyze the data, looking at the, the problem in a different way. Mm -hmm. No, I love it. And yeah, and adding some statistical packages and other things into the conversation. Yeah. Very good. Um, anything else on this topic before we move to the three questions that I ask every guest? You got to give a kind of a, take a bigger picture perspective here with what's going on with COVID, right? Infectious diseases see no, no, no border. Uh, we live in a very globalized world. That's not a buzzword. Uh, pathogens move around. They don't care where you come from. Uh, things emerge and move around. Uh, the swine industry needs to be this to increase the level of biosecurity for sure and understand more, not only the viral side, the, the pathogen side, the ecology of these pathogens, what's going on and how can we improve pig health, pig health in general and not just focus on one pathogen or, or another. So if the goal is to, you know, target salmonella in the swine production in the swine industry, we can't just combat salmonella in the growing and finishing farms. We need to think at the industry in a holistic way, right? Because that's the way it works. Uh, and there's not gonna be a silver bullet that's gonna oh, answer the question, but with more surveillance, understanding of the ecology, we can get better at things. I love it. Very good. Uh, you know, Dr. Neto, I always ask, you know, what's your favorite um, pig related book, but, and I, and I like to ask that question, but also uh, beyond that, the, on your area of expertise, what's your favorite book as well for those that are into that? Yeah. So in terms of swine books, I'm going to, I, I'm going to unapologetically suggest the Mycoplasmas in Swine, which is a new book that uh, just came out. Uh, it's uh, edited by a group, a nice group of folks, Dominique Maez from Belgium, uh, uh, Dr. Sibylla and, and others. And that's an amalgamation of uh, years and years of science in, in swine uh, mycoplasmas. And I, I know I had a minor contribution in one chapter there, 
but it's a really nice book talking from genetics, ecology, uh, genomics, and, and biology of mycoplasmas in swine. I think it's a really nice book, but I'm, I'm, uh, I'm biased. Uh, in terms of uh, my, my area of genomics, bacterial genomics, you know, it's the standard book of molecular uh, genetics of bacteria. It's, uh, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the genomics is just facilitating us to be able to see things at scale. Mm -hmm. But genetics is the, the basis for, for everything. So it's the, the hardcore work that other folks have done in previous generations, understanding the function of a gene. And it's all there, all learning genetics of bacteria. So the, yeah, that's, those would be my two, two, two books. Okay, very good. And then how about a book outside of livestock, outside of um, your area of expertise can be anything? Yeah, so there's one book that I so I as you are evolving as a professional, you you kind of get get sidetracked and and lose focus <laughs> at, at times, right? Uh, to say the least. So the book that I like a lot is you know, I need to read it multiple times to improve my focus. Is the one thing mm -hmm. from Gary Keller. So it's uh how to you know focus your energy on on one problem, right? We, we kind of sometimes spread thing and working on multiple things and never being productive and getting overly stressed. Yes. Oh boy. That's a great book. I need to read it again. <laughs> and then <laughs> there's one in this area that I love, which is also an area that I struggle. It's called um, Hell Yeah or No by Derek Sivers. Super cool as well on, the, on that arena. Yeah, I know. That's, it's really hard to say, you know, to learn how to say no and stay focused, right? We tend to... Uh, especially right now in this with this uh pressure for multidisciplinary work we tend to kind of you know trying to do multiple things and uh, there is there's something to be said about the uh lack of expertise that's occurring in society everybody right now thinks uh, they can you know i do something and i am an epidemiologist and you know, everybody right now there's a lot of people talking you know, uh, they see the COVID data and then they start interpreting the data as if they were an epidemiologist, right? So right, everyone is an epidemiologist. Yeah, right now everybody is an epidemiologist. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And then the last question is: um, In your opinion, what sets apart successful swine professionals from those uh, that are not? Yeah, you know, and when you when you ask me that question, I go back to certain simple principles that I've had since. Uh, my training in veterinary medicine. There is no substitute for passion uh, at all. Uh, without passion, if you drive your career without passion, uh, it may work for you. For me, it doesn't because right. inevitably I'll, I'll be thinking what I really love and, and yeah. not just the, the another outcome. There is no way to substitute hard work. I truly believe that hard work uh, uh, overwhelms any other aspect. You know, if you grind, you you get there. There's pain. Career development is a journey. And then my last uh, my last two points would be: How do we really do career management? Right? How do we make choices? And I don't have a good answer for that because you can see that I moved around, right? Uh, but uh, one thing that I've learned over time is to have find good mentors and listen to them. Find them. Uh, maybe easy, but sometimes we don't listen, right? We we hear, but we don't listen. And I believe that the, if you find good mentors and you listen, you don't need to exactly follow what they're saying, but you need to reflect on what they're saying. And I think that people, well, are not sometimes we're not trained to have mentors, right? To go out of vet school and you go to the in swine industry and I just go. Or perhaps you need to find one of these guys, the swine, so experienced swine veterinarians. Uh, I'm talking specifically about veterinarians to guide you. Uh, how do you develop a career in the swine industry and, and go from there, right? Right. And you're talking about mentors and, and listen to them. And one day I, I, I listened to one person talking about, you know, we all like education, right? But sometimes, even better than education, sometimes is uh, our instructions. <laughs> so if your mentors are saying sometimes, so not always, because we do need to have a re be original thinkers and, and have a critical thinking. 
but there are there is a time to just follow the instructions <laughs> you know what i mean yeah i know my my boss uh, andrew benson who is my pi here my postdoc he always tells me is look there is multiple paths to the top of the mountain i'm just trying to uh, exclude the ones that I've used that failed for me. So you get there faster than I get there, than I mm -hmm. got there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and success means different things to different people. But, you know, I think that if you wake up in the morning, you do something that you are, you know, have passion for you and people are enjoying your service, then that's success. But to get there, you need to be able to grind and listen. And sometimes, especially the newest generation, I speak of my brother, you know, and the end is not big there, but they, they're not trained to, to listen very much. And <laughs> they need to listen more to what, you know, the experience I've had or you've had, because, you know, the experience, that experience should not be the way you guide your life. But I wanted to prevent you from making a lot of the mistakes I made. Right. Yep. That's that makes sense, my friend. Well, really appreciate that, Dr. Neto. Thanks for all the insights, and uh, I'm sure the audience appreciate it as well. Oh, thank you. It was really nice participating here, and I I hope we we you know have another discussion on the topic soon. No doubt. Thanks so much. Imagine if with a few key concepts you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training in applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.